For this book we're going to talk about, last night um, we had a, a meeting, a, we have a craft class and the whole school was invited in and um, grief was no small part of it. Um, my friend who gave me the idea of the shitbird um, was present there in a way that I haven't uh, felt in in a long time. And this is when I was 20, we were both 27 years old when he did this, when he killed himself. And so here are all these people um, um, knowing about him and uh, expressing, you know, how he's affected their lives too. And um, it was quite an evening for me. I, I didn't get a lot of sleep. <laughs> it was, uh, so this feels in a way like an extension of that. And um, Have you talked much publicly to your classes in previous years about Ralph or was this is this kind of a new revelation? Uh, well, in, in my particular class, my master class, um, the students came, attended last night who have, have been, were, were in it, many over the, who are no longer, there are those present and those who were in it many, many years ago, and they all knew about it. They all knew that the shitbird was his creation. And uh, so, yes. Yes, it's it uh, that that relationship to grief. It was it was so interesting how, you know, your daughter has such an effect on on this large community and um, this writing contest, and and I could see her in your faces right now. <laughs> so um, that's a big mark on the yeah. interest. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't end. <laughs> Well, you know, in terms of the, in terms of like the specific things, in terms of the businessy part of this. So what, what we wanted to talk to you about in terms of the book, um, Fernette's going to put a, a little section in, in her uh, newsletter on the book, you know, the, for things that we talked about now. So we wanted to just kind of touch on a couple of bases that we think will be of special interest to the community in your book. And, uh, and then, um, you know, we'll have probably some extra things to, to touch on <laughs> outside of the context of, of the, the interview formal um, uh, that, uh, that, that, that I certainly uh, really enjoyed and, and, and sort of um, spoke to me from the book also. But, um, you know, I think that the two main touch points, I think, for the community in general are going to be the writing topic, which, um, you know, as Fernet and Monica have found, I think, in working with the kids, is is just a really valuable thing to think about in in terms of uh, working with young dyslexic students. It's been really, really ignored. So, we do want to talk about, um, you know, just get a short comment on you on on persona writing for the community that you can just kind of directly put in there. But the second is really sort of the background to that, which was this whole context that you laid out so beautifully in the book, which was your discovery of personas through fiction and the impact that those made on your own development as a person. And, uh, you know, I love the story of uh, discovering the moviegoer and, uh, and the impact that that had on you. And, uh, really almost the discovery that these personas provided kind of an organizing principle or organizing filter in order to deal with uh, a lot of these struggles and a lot of these uh, experiences that were sort of these, these disassembled fragments of experience that you had and it provided a way of, of beginning to organize that and discover what, what persona you wanted to have. And I think that whole process of watching you kind of find your way to, to strength and to, to sanity and to health through investigating these personas was what was so what was so powerful in this book. And, uh, so that whole it, there's that whole kind of process between the whole you know the whole shitbird the self the self doubt the failure experience then the discovering of the voices and then the the you know 
the dual sort of catharsis, but also strengthening that comes through that. And could you talk a little bit about that process of discovering the role of persona in your own life and that whole that whole milieu, uh, just kind of in brief, in, in, that we can use in. You know, well, I didn't know it at the time, but um, my struggle with learning how to read played no small part in my creating this idea of persona writing or personas. Um, I desperately needed a view of myself that was kinder than the one I was providing, that was more sympathetic. Um, and I remember creating a boy lying in bed with his mother who was reading me a comics who um, could read and tried to imagine what it would feel like to be him. I mean, I created this other being. I always created imaginary friend. I was an only child in a tough neighborhood and I had to create a tough persona for myself who wouldn't be picked on, who would frankly hit before being hit. And um, I based it on my father and others. And I had to create a self that I didn't feel all that comfortable with, but that clearly it was someone I, who I was on the streets. And you really had a, you would you couldn't be on a bike and ride down the street. There was a guy who would basically ride up next to new kids and slap them hard across the face. And if they didn't fight back, he would take their bikes. And I had to create a persona who would strike first in order to not lose a bike. And I created a persona who, who could read when I couldn't. And it created a sense of not being an idiot. And because it's kind of hard to embody, inhabit that idiot presence and live with yourself. So I created imaginary friends. I would. You know, I think you know that from the, I would go to the beach and create imaginary frogmen and we would all be heroes. I was by myself a lot and I created an imaginary community. And so when I could read, I found personas through, through whose eyes I looked at myself and my family and with a more sympathetic light. And that was a stairway, a lifeline to writing. Does that answer your, your question? Yeah, I think that's a that's a that's a perfect introduction into into that topic. Uh, I mean, I think there's some more some more threads that I want to pull on um, uh, with that one also sort of moving forward because you know, I think one of the most poignant scenes from my dyslexia was the the talk that you had with the I can't remember if it was a teacher, if it was a principal or a guidance person or something, where they asked what you're thinking about doing in your, with your life, and you said, I want to be a writer. And you have this description, you know, I can't remember the words, but the, the visual image of this big guy laughing until he, sh he shook. Uh, and uh, this whole this whole process of discovering your authorial voice or your or your your sense of how how you were going to express yourself as a as a as an artist um, uh, as a writer um, could you comment sort of briefly on that process that took place you know through the teens and twenties yeah. Well Joyce was a tutor that I think the school pretty much forced us for me to have, because I had already been basically held back twice. And there was no, they couldn't do it a third time in Rochester. And um, so we had to, whether they could afford it or not, have this guy. And out of frustration one day, he, he asked me, well, what am I gonna do with my life if I never learn how 
how to read. And he clearly felt he was an ex school principal. He became a tutor. And I told him I wanted to be a writer. <laughs> I think I mostly did it to piss him off. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I have no idea why, why I came up with that. And uh, he couldn't stop laughing, right? <laughs> it was waves of fat. <laughs> <laughs> right? He couldn't fit under the desk. And of course, I laughed too. And he thought I was laughing whatever he was laughing at. And I remember that. And, uh, and of course, Joyce, one of our great writers, his name had to be Joyce, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Mr. Joyce, I never forgot that. Um, I forgot the second part of that. <laughs> like the whole process of, of discovering how you wanted to express your own, what, you know, how, how you went through the process of discovering how to express your, what you wanted to convey in art. You know, the, I would have given you a different answer um, before writing this book. And in writing the book, and it came out, I articulated it in a way that surprised me last night in this class. Um, but I, I talked about one's relationship with grief and you there's also one's relationship, I feel, my relationship with my vulnerability. I mean, you know, the stupid kid who was in the dummy class, the poor kid, um, you know, in this neighborhood, um, one of the few Jewish families in this particular neighborhood. Um, I couldn't afford to be vulnerable uh, on the streets. And I was, I was, you know, I'm very emotional. And I, uh, I created an imaginary world that helped me get by and I had to hide, I had to repress all that vulnerability, all that neediness because it was a sign of weakness. I feel that also there's a discovery I made in the book that um, shocked me because Hemingway was someone who was very important to me. And through my friendship with Mailer, I also discovered they, they had their vulnerability. They considered feminine. They considered it unmasculine. And that's what all the bravado, the, the bullfighting, the super macho, um, patina, the mask that they put on, which was, you know, they, they couldn't deal with their own feelings of vulnerability. And they thought it was unmasculine. They thought it was, I think a large part of all the drinking and craziness and endless wipes uh, was all about. And I think my relationship with my feelings of vulnerability um, uh, certainly came out in my friendship with Ralph. We, my, when we met, we identified with each other and um, we both wanted to keep each other going. And writing was a way of doing that. Being creative was a way of doing that. And when he killed himself, I thought I would. I, I really didn't, didn't know if I was gonna make it. I mean, you know, if, and creating, turning his shit bird, which killed him as far as I was concerned, into my number one public enemy that I had to become visible of all these dark forces in myself. I created my wanting to be Hemingway and my friendship with Mailer and this fearlessness had to do with trying to compensate for feelings of absolute vulnerability. And um, my friendship, I'm sure what he saw in me was the vulnerable poet in himself, that he had to pretend to be somebody else. He created, and with me, he didn't have to be because it didn't work. I wasn't gonna lie to his wife and say that his girlfriend was my girlfriend. And um, 
So I think in writing this book, I understand my lifelong, um, first of all, denial of that kind of, I mean, the writing all comes out of, you know, dealing with the darkness in myself, being unaf not letting it control me. Um, my uh, being an analysis and trying to understand those forces. It, it was a life force and a death wish, both very profound and powerful. And um, I felt it was my job to save my father and I failed. It was my job to save Ralph and I failed. And then I unconsciously realized that it was my job to save myself. And I, I shouldn't fail at it. And then I took on my students. And then I took on my, <laughs> my students, which came out last night. In terms of the in terms of the relationship between the writing and the and, and expressing the vulnerability, um, the uh, do early do you think early in your career, especially when you were were still in this phase and being enamored with with Hemingway and, and Norman Mailer, do, do you think that the persona has allowed you to outsource that vulner, vulnerability and, in a sense, give it a little bit of distance from from you and the sense of opening up about what was really going on inside yourself to being this is you were relating a story that was being told by another another person. I mean, did did it give you that kind of distance that made you comfortable sharing that? Yes. Yeah. By finding personas and looking at myself and my life through their eyes, I there was a sense of forgiveness. There was a sense of understanding and sympathy that I had a hard time providing for myself. And um, without even under, ever understanding that, this was what I was selling and giving to my students and with is why they never wanted to leave the classes. I would have to have conversations with them. And I think it's, there's all these people that want to come in. I think it's, they're, they, because they were, they liked themselves. There was that sense of um, looking at yourself through, Hemingway, who was a, whose life was a mess, he was a fall down drunk. He had five, six wives. He could had no, no impossible to really have any intimacy. Created in his work a sense of nobility. He's the one who, have, who, his, the elegance and nobility of his style affected American fiction and world fiction for the following century because he looked at things with a kind of, with, with sympathy, with, with uh, you, you, if you looked at your own life through his eyes, he, he gave you a gift of, uh, uh, well, Cheever explained that to me once. He said, nobility, that he could provide for himself in his own life, but he provided through this persona. I have a question because, um, you know, so reading the book, it, it, it seems like such a, like a, a very literary autobiography, you know, and if you know, for me, I only know some of the, some of the authors and the poets that are, that are mentioned, but I, I guess my question is, is I'm trying to connect the early story of you and then who you are now. And was there like a, breakthrough like now you're very you're very literary person in, in reading and writing and and how was there a breakthrough experience or a book or something that connected you to just really getting fascinated by these writers or was it just you know i don't know i just i, I can understand like how to survive you develop personas but well, boy, you know, it seems like you know everybody. <laughs> you know, you know, you know so so many works, and you also you know write with such such depth. But how how did that actually? When did you start making that transition to this this um, either being fascinated by the persona of writing that that you read of other authors, or or how did how did that happen? Well, I at first 
I wanted to be an artist. I mean, I, I think my father drew cartoons and taught me how to draw and somewhat, and I identified with Van Gogh and artists that I saw because there was all that emotion in their work. See, I had all this emotion I didn't know what to do with. And I had to find a place to put it. And uh, some of it was destructive. And, and um, it was such a crazy family with my paranoid schizophrenic uncle living off the kitchen, listening to a police radio night and day. And um, also finding my way through hell to go to his, through his to, to my two libraries, the the pornographic, uh, well, it wasn't even pornographic, it was Playboy on one hand and all the uh, Yates and T.S. Eliot and Hemingway first editions on the other. And um, I, even though I couldn't read for a long time, I would go up there and know that these were precious items. And I had a kind of trust I could find in them. I could see that they were wrapped in cellophane and packed so nicely. And um, my uncle wanted to be a, a writer. Crazy Jake wanted to be a writer. Now, when he, he would terrorize us, I mean, often when he was having a fit, my mother would take me as a child and my grandmother, we would lock the bathroom door, put a chair under the knob and sit in the bathtub. We were also attacked by neighbors. If he would get into a fight with someone, they, our neighbors, the Russians and Italians would come across and attack our house. And I, if my father wasn't home, we would have to hide in the bathtub, in the bathroom. So there was a, there was a world where I had to somehow deal with all this emotion, fear, uh, violence. And I, um, Am I forgetting your question a little? I mean, I I, I want to I don't want to lose that. A stri uh, uh, I just. Am, how I, did you am I answering it? A little bit, yeah. Like how, so, but so so the the literature when you the, the literary, yeah. Yeah. Well, I knew that to him, Jake. The part of me wanted to impress him that he wrote letters to the editor that he loved all these books. And I would take some of these books and sneak them into my room. And even if I couldn't read them, I would see that the print was precious, that the books were precious. Um, it was only after I had a first edition, I have it here, of The Sun Also Rises, that I was so moved by what Mary Hemingway said that I offered to give it to her. That it was only after I did that that she took me up to the studio where he killed himself. And I didn't realize, I forgot that this was where he did that. But um, I began to identify with these, right? In the beginning, it was painting. I was a school cartoonist. It was, I had to have a place to put all that emotion. Art was the first place. And then I somehow, when I could read, uh, I loved everything I was able to read. It wasn't a lot. It still isn't a lot. I don't read anymore and I absolutely have to. I don't know about most of the stuff going on right now. I can't keep up with it. I don't try. But the books, I had a precious relationship with every book. The Hemingway short stories. One of the reasons I liked them is they were so short. And declarative and easy to read and understand. And um, what he wrote about things that I did not, it would take me years to understand, but I was identifying with, he came out of this, a similar world. It was a much more sophisticated world, but it was a world of trying to survive. Um, and I identified with him and i also must have known that this persona that wrote that stories was so elegant that even imagining looking at my life and my family through those eyes changed everything 
So I had gotten a habit of doing that and I continued doing it and it's, it was a lifeline. Yeah, I think that's so, I think that's the thing that, that um, struck me the, with the most force in, in the book was just the, so we, we just finished um, rewrites for a second edition for Dyslexic Advantage a couple of weeks ago. So it's out being Congratulations. Uh, yeah, so, uh, we're in that inner space. But, I, but I, sort of, I sort of wish we had talked to you about this um, on this topic a little early because one of the final chapters is sort of about developing developing a self-image. And this is exactly this topic. Uh, the, this whole process. So we did some research with the, the people involved in the dyslexic advantage community. And over over ninety percent of the of the kids had major problems with self esteem, and you know for for very significant numbers that ran into you know significant uh, psychological issues with depression and anxiety and things that they were under treatment for. So I mean, this whole this whole ability to form a healthy way of looking at yourself and a healthy way of interpreting the world is is a enormous problem for kids in the with with dyslexia and there's so much wisdom i think in the way that you lay out the process of working through your your own you know the, the these accusatory voices and this this sense of, of failure to building a positive self that that would be you know it's what we were trying to do in our chapter on self-image, but it's done so beautifully and, and so so clearly. So I would definitely love to get people sort of looking looking to um, to this current book because I think it it's there's just a profound relevance to the to the whole life struggle that so many of the kids that we're working with are, and it's it's such a way. I don't think that people, it's a much more tangible approach, I think, to finding, to finding sanity by looking at, looking for voices that reflect the kind of vision that, that you can apply on yourself in a healthy way. I, I just, I love that. I love that aspect of, of the book. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it was Hemingway's voice or, or you know whether it was Binks Bowling or whatever, but just you, you read through these 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 narrators and find a vision that, when turned back on yourself, gives you a healthy way of of, of, of looking at your own experience. I just I love that, and and uh, it's so powerful and it's so clear. And um, in some cases, there's also there's not another way to really get that experience of of walking in someone else's mind as in literature or, or something like that, because there's too much of the everyday kind of little, you know, trickery of life kind of thing, you know, like that, that, that it really is something, although, you know, often literature is taught as a, well, you just have to memorize these kind of plot events and things like that. But, but to really experience different philosophies, different ways of seeing the world and interpreting events, you can learn a lot from that as a human being, especially, you know, when you may not see models around you or, or you're so unformed or shifting yourself. So I think that's a, that's a kind of really powerful thing that comes across in, in, in your shared experience. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I'm listening to you and I'm under, I, I don't know what's going on in my life recently I like I'm understanding things I never understood before like, like and, and then class last night I came to something with that vulnerability and listening to the two of you I wow <laughs> oh boy <laughs> um I I think I'm I'm gonna write one more book of poems I don't want to you know, I, I'm not like other. I, I'm not literary as as most liter as most of my friends. They are much more so. They're better read than they. Um, um, but I just understood something. I I I I 
and why. I told myself I was going to write one more um, book and of poems, and it was going to be mostly about my mother. And now that I was finally managed to get rid of my father, get him out of the way, <laughs> have done with him that. And now I understand while you were talking, an image came to me, which is probably on the deepest level, the real explanation of the personas and why it was going to be art first. And I, I remember um, I had already been for neighborhoods or whatever held back and uh, first grade, I think. And then I went, I was in a worse school in town and I, it was a, and my mother was called to school. I had gotten into a fight and they were going to help hold me back again. And the teacher and the principal, uh, my mother had to come and I had to sit next to her and watch her hear that the um, principal actually said to her that um, they were gonna hold me back, but if it happened again, the only place that I would go to is a reformatory. That's where kids went from our school. And that, you know, they didn't know what to do with me. And um, I think there's a section in my, and on the way back, it was snowing, it's Rochester. And she slipped in the ice and she was just crying and lying there and looking up at me with a, a way like I was her only hope. Ah, yes. I mean, it's like I was the only good thing in her life. My father was, he was probably, she thought he was going to marry her and take her and put her in a house of her own and she wouldn't have to be in her mother's house and he lied and came and stayed 20 years. So all she had and she risked her life having me. So what she had was me. And she looked at me from that with such a sense of disappointment, like was I going to fail her also. And I realized that what my I what I better become something that was going to make her proud. I better. I didn't know what the fuck was wrong with me. I didn't know about dyslexia or any of that. But I better do something that would give her something. I think that was the mo of my life. I think that was the the thing that kept me going and um, to make her proud. Because awesome. that look on her face, that isn't what she bargained for. That wasn't. So I would try to compensate. I try to find things I could, I could draw when I couldn't read. And then when I could, I could, I was going to become her in the Hemingway. And when she died in uh, an Alzheimer's ward, there was a scrapbook that I still have. I keep thinking I'm going to show my kids. I don't haven't come around to that where she kept every scrap of my life every published thing every news item every it's it was her lifeline it was the thing that kept her going and despite all the disappointment i represent so i just understood right now i'm talking to the two of you I, there had to be a, last night I was talking about the, the, why this book is affecting me in a way that books of poems don't. I, I feel vulnerable with this book and the reactions I'm getting is more dramatic than in a book. You know, you write a poem, you write 400 drafts, it's a piece of art and then you read it, you read the piece of art. You're very far removed from the pain or whatever that inspired it. Not this book. This conversation that wouldn't come out of a poem. While you were talking, I remembered that scene, and I, I, the transfer, I had the real transformation had to be, I had to become someone that wasn't going to hurt her like that. Yeah. I couldn't add to the disappointment. It's just, it's just amazing.
a beautiful thing. It's amazing. You know, I, I mean, I don't want to totally bore you with the, the science part, but in the past 10 years, sort of what's what's really solidified with this whole kind of version of the mind strengths that we develop is that they're all related to one another and they all grow out of the ability to take personal memories, so memories of past experience and create models with them, either either models that reproduce the actual world or models of fanciful worlds fanciful objects, you know, new things, but they're, they're models that are based on experience. They're not, they're not projections from abstractions or from theories. They're, they're actual constructions of, of things from experience and they, they're dimensional in the sense that you can say more of this, less of this, you know, in, in multiple domains. So you can you can you can really recreate personalities and i think this is what this is what you know is so powerful with the personas is that you're creating a model through a persona you're creating a model that allows you to project what the reaction of that narrator would be to different inputs to different experiences that you're putting in to different other things and because you can create these complex dimensional models you can really you can really use those to, to simulate um, responses in various kinds of ways. So you're, you're, you know, you have your, you know, your Hamlet persona, you have your, you know, your Binks Bowling, you have, you know, your, your uh, Hemingway narrator, and all of those are models that you can then use to filter information through. And I think that, that this is what this is why this is so powerful. I think it's such an important message for for the dyslexic kids is because they can they're built to they're built to do this kind of thing. So many of them they're built to create these multidimensional persona type models in their brain, and you know, but nobody's ever really talked about this that that I've ever that I've ever seen anywhere in a way that I think is so so applicable and so practical for young people. And I, I would love to find a way that we could really that we could really get the younger kids understanding understanding this. Because I think there's so many, there's so many people that would look at this and they would say, oh, that's escapism. Oh, that's that's a that's a, a bad way of trying to cope with reality. You're trying to imagine your way out of a harmful situation. But that's just that's missing the point entirely. And it's it's so it's not escapist it's it's a way to re-enter i mean you know walker percy was always talking about trying to re-enter reality that's been sort of encrusted over with all of this falsehood and it, this is a way of, of you know of dealing with that re-entry problem um, through these other personas and i think it's so it's so healthy and finding Finding this new persona is actually the goal for all of these kids, and, and I think that we're just we're not we're not presenting them a way of, of understanding that, of, of thinking about the task that's facing them. And I, I just love the story about about your mother, where you you were finding your identity and this this need to be this need to be the person who made your mother proud. And, huh. and it's it's so it's so powerful. It really is. You know, I'm thinking of um, this first reading I gave out here at a place called suitably the church. It's like a cult, new cultural center. And afterwards, there was a question from someone which I loved, but people moaned. <laughs> the guy started his own school. It's, 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 it's not a rival writing school or whatever, but he, he came up with a, a question that um, I don't think it, it's, it was supposed to throw me. I think he was trying to understand the idea of persona. And he said, um, he said, what does it feel like to be an imposter? In other words, you're pretending to be someone else. You're an imposter. And I love the, but the people around him <laughs> said, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one person in the audience said something to the effect that, talk about shit birds. <laughs> <laughs> But I love the question because it gave me an opportunity to say, 
And I think this maybe touches on what you were talking about with all the models. I always personally felt like an imposter. Yeah. Uh, like a phony. Yeah. I never felt I was anybody in particular. And um, I created, I thought that if I had to have a personality, I had to create an illusion of being someone. It was only through finding a sympathetic persona or a successful writer who was going to give me the time to look at me and allowed me to see myself in a more charitable light where I didn't feel like an imposter. And I remember how that went over because it's just, you know, the imposter is a negative term. Yeah. And the whole idea of having a persona is the Ciaran yeah. turn that negativity into inspiration to into something positive. Yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. And so it's also a complete misunderstanding of the reality that, that everybody has personas that, that they occupy. I mean, you don't, you can't exist without a persona. There's, it's an organ, it's, it's the model that organizes your experience. And if you lack that, you have psychosis. I mean, there, there, there's no there's no existing outside of a persona at all and you know they i don't even know what it means to say that they're more or less authentic i mean they can be more or less healthy they can comport closer they can be more functional in dealing with reality but um this notion that there's some deep authentic self that we all have to discover i just that doesn't make any sense to me i think what we're we're all looking for our personas that, that that work that allow us to function that allow us to that have the greatest explanatory power for all, all of our experience and allow us to to tie our lives together in a functional way and, and it's more empathetic i mean i think if anything it, it seems like it's an openness to learn from other other people's lives or other people's thoughts and feelings and so i i think i mean I think if anything, it's, you know, it, it is this openness to say, you know, maybe that's a better way, you know, I, I mean, just the idea that you're sort of born with one, I don't, what, what's the age where you're supposed to have a fixed personality? I don't know, you know, <laughs> you know all these things change, you know, I mean, maybe that's, which is the disease. <laughs> Right. I think it's 102. <laughs> of course, when you're 101, it'll be 108. So you're, you're <laughs> yeah. to right, right. Push, push that. <laughs> but who's counting, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. right. When you have a fixed personality, it's so. It's so. Oh, it's, oh, Thank goodness. God. This is really, this is just a, it's a universal, it's a universal process. And I think that, I think that you, that, that you really bring it out though much, you bring it out in a way that, that um, I, I love the, I love the wild aphorism that you quoted also. And I, I won't be able to repeat it, but the Oscar Wilde about term, finding the real person you have to, to, to discover anything about a man, you have to look at the mask. Give a man a mask and he'll tell you the truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is, this, you know, it's getting at the same thing in a different way. And it, it's, uh, there, there, there are ways of accessing parts of yourself through, through these kind of filters that we have to create to be able to deal with some of these uncomfortable things that, the healthy response to eventually is to like Fernet Fernet was kind of talking about you incorporate these other pieces into your larger model. Um, but you need yeah. ways to approach this stuff safely uh, before you can before you can bring it on. You can't just start at this most most miserable, most helpless point and suddenly bring in all this information in a flood. You need to to access it bit by bit. And I think you know in the, the, the more strictly autobiographical parts of the book, you, you present pictures of that along the way where you're kind of learning how to 
incorporate more and more of these different views uh, into this larger perspective. And um, um, you know, I think I think there's really something important about that process that um, it's really healthy to talk about. Well, you know, listening to you, and now I have another image. It's like um, that I'm connecting to. This is so helpful. I mean, I, I, I've touched on it and I wrote about it, but I never connected to it the way I am now. You know, my father got embezzled and my mother thought she was marrying this guy who had a biggest parking lot in Rochester and was going to have a house in the suburbs. And he got embezzled a week before and he moved in, stayed in the slums in the inner city. And here, he, the first five years of my life, he was a janitor in the night shift. He'd come home in the morning and then he tried to build himself up. And I, when I was a little older, drive around with him and see him sit in the car and try to get a location at DuPont's or Kodak or some big place. And the schlump, this guy, um, five foot one covered with dust and had been up all night being a janitor. He would remake himself in front of me, he'd look in the rear view mirror and he'd um, give himself a bill of goods and sell himself something and give him, talk out loud in front of me, uh, creating a persona. And then I'd go with him and into a factory, into a back door, and he'd see somebody in a suit and he'd sell himself. He'd actually be funny and smart. And often we'd go away with a new location with his vending machines. And I watched him transform himself from someone living in the slums who couldn't give his wife or his son anything into someone who was going to impress big shots. And I probably learned that. You know, I when I met Mailer, all these other young guys were trying to impress him. And I had a at this bar turned myself into someone who would. I took that page out of my father's book. Uh, I, uh, he would create a persona that would, we'd go, we'd walk, and once he had a location, we'd go into these places and they had all, all the suits would come out with the workers and they wanted to be around my father. He made them feel good. He entertained them. They wanted to be around them. And he couldn't make us feel good at home. The reality was something else. But he would transform himself, which is the process of imagine. He would imagine being someone other people wanted to be around. And he would transform himself into that. And that's, I guess, what I've been doing all my life, whether I understood it or not. I, I watched him do it in the rearview mirror of a car. And then I'd watch him who he was at home. So I guess that was a persona. Yeah, and it's, a, you know, it's this process of tying them together and of, of uh, creating an integrated life out of, out of these multiple personas. I mean, that's the, that's the challenging aspect of it. It's, and it's, it's the challenge that we all face. I mean, I think one of the things that I've, you know, that I've come to in reading, you know, my dyslexia and failure specifically dealt with your father and just the times that you've talked about him is, you know, there was a real something there too that could have been built upon and just, you know, if the opportunity had been right, if the environment had been right, if, you know, if, if there were a few other things that, that you know, maybe in his past that he could have, could have got over, but there there was a there was a core there where he had something to to build upon at some point in his life, and, and uh, you know, and and this, these things he's acting out in this persona, you know, there were they were probably things about him that could have 
that could have come to fruition in the right in the right place at the at the right time. So well, the last two years of his life, he moved us across the county line into the suburbs, and we actually had a, a suburban by basement apartment. But my mother was happy, I was happy, went to a better school, and um, he he built the business up so it was successful, and companies wanted to buy it. It was a big national lending company, and it was going to give him the first money he would ever really have. And instead of accepting that deal, he decided, well, if it's worth so much now, what if I build it up? And he went into debt buying more machines and couldn't afford the help to f do it all. I was working with him after school and, I, and it gave him a heart attack and killed him. So he could have been successful, yeah. but he couldn't. Ex yeah. The same recipe for failure he found again. Yeah, yeah. It's just a, it's just a classic, uh, your classic tragic tale. You know, it's it's it's, it's a Tolstoyan, uh, you know, the how how much land kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's trying to trying to go too far before the sun sets. And uh, but, well, know. I'm a chip off the old. My most successful book is called Failure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which which I, I absolutely love. But yeah, I'm resonating. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're fearless. That's why I think you know. I mean, there are people who wouldn't who wouldn't do that. So I mean, and everybody, everybody, but Monica told me not to call it that. My editor, everyone <laughs> said, friends would said, "Are you kidding? You're going to feed your critics." I could just read the reviews now. Schultz called it the right thing. It's a big failure. The only person who liked it was Monica, and she liked this title too. She's well. She, she obviously knows how to pick them. So yeah, yeah, she does. <laughs> good, thing to, good person to trust. I, I was really interested too in your comment in there about um, Philip Roth and, and patrimony and how you saw the the connection with your with failure and, and your your relationship with your dad and, and Philip Roth with his dad because it, I love that book also and my my father was not a financial failure at all but to, he he was a um, well he is we we we're we're very very different people and have always had that kind of lingering sense of just kind of not not really connecting in the same way. And so those, those books both were books that I really, that I really loved. Um, I don't think I've ever laughed harder than they, that I did in, in Patrimony when, when the, the, the old guy who kept pressuring Philip Roth to read his, his autobiography from Auschwitz <laughs> finally gave it to him and it turned out to be The Am Amorous Adventures of Max and Al Auschwitz. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought falling out of your chair laughing was a joke until that happened. That was, that was literally the, the I, I don't know how you can possibly get a better ironic distance between between Auschwitz and this, and this sort of <laughs> crazy story, but that was uh, that was about the funniest thing I've ever read, I think. But um, keep going across the well, well, the, the, sum, the summer I knew him, he he was literally walking around in a disguise. I mean, he would um, disguise himself because he couldn't go down the street. I mean, Portnoy had become very famous, I think, the year before, and so he would disguise himself and he would put on hats and sunglasses and coats. <laughs> and, uh, so he had, he had another persona. Yeah, well, it's definitely definitely a character, uh, many characters. So, well, well, we won't take up any more of your time, but it's been uh, fantastic. Oh, it's been great seeing the two of you. Yeah, great. Yeah, time. no, it's uh, you know, so I feel like I'm back out in the world a little. <laughs> you know, it's just hunkered down here. The classes are all remote. Yeah. So you last night there was 97 people, and wow. they were all, all little boxes. <laughs> and. Uh, I didn't know most of them. I mean, because they're in other classes that I haven't met, and and we have different eight different time zones. Wow! So it's um, you know, we, and so it's such a weird feeling. Like I've never been more 
hunkered down and encapsulated or but on the on the other hand universal <laughs> because there's a guy from rome and there's the guy from the, the wisconsin and the people from so it's so weird isn't it it yeah, is it's, it's, really, nice. it's really bizarre yeah. you two are really terrific i have to say you are really what you do is just it's beyond it's beyond the pale. It's just so incredible. You help so many people, and um, your book's so valuable. And um, it's it's got it's such an act of generosity that you reach into yourself and pull all this out and give to others. It's well, it's a fantastic community. No, you know, no, I mean, nobody's gained more been, from it than we have. It's yeah, been no, it's just been, nothing but nothing but a joy. It's yeah. been. Uh, we've met the most amazing, interesting, courageous, innovative, wonderful people that we just never could have imagined. It. So it's been it's been fantastic, and you're certainly high on the list of the of the pleasures that, uh, that you know we come across if, if uh, we hadn't done this. So it's it's been you know if we, if we could if we could bottle just a little bit of the vision that we've that we've had doing this and get other people to see the world in this way and, you know, to see what what dyslexic minds are really doing and it would just things would be so different it's just but it's you know it's it was the experience of working with these young people that were ending up in in psychiatric hospitals we had a child that committed suicide that we worked with for you know briefly and and, and just just seeing the, these beautiful, creative, talented, interested kids who go into kindergarten and first grade, excited that the world is opening up before them and just turning into these, these flowers that are just, just shriveling in on themselves in just such a short period of time. It just, that's been such a motivation for us uh, to do this because we, we see just how unnecessary it is and how kids that really have the proper attitude to themselves just can come through even if even with a lot of struggles they can still come through strong and in a good position to, to really flourish as adults when all this stuff just doesn't matter to what the students so it's so yeah. we've got a lot of inspiration so it keeps us going well it's such a gift of empathy what well, one of the things in hearing you talk i think maybe the first or second time of the feeling of that one story is valuable because it is a story. Yeah. It doesn't have to have fit a pattern. You know, it's not like comparing it to someone else's more successful story. Yeah. It's a story in it in and of itself. Yeah. And um, that's an advantage. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it should be heard. Yeah. Yeah. There's just I, this, um, this also has just given me just. A lot of insights. I think just the process of going through the book and talking with you today, it, I think, really helps crystallize some things that have been in the back of my mind for a long time. Also, and I think we'll be able to, to do some things going forward also to help because I think it's this whole process of reframing and being able to bring all of these different aspects of experience into a persona that that unifies the experience in a healthy way. That's the that's the challenge. That's a much bigger challenge than learning how to read or how to spell or any of those other things. It's how to be this person who has these talents and these struggles in a, in a healthy, in a healthy, integrated way. That's by far the biggest challenge. And this obsession with with early identification and early treatment, while all of that's good and we support all of that, that's not the biggest challenge. That's the you know number two or three. And this is this is really the biggest challenge. It's, well, it's, I think that's absolutely right. Trying to survive the self-image you create of yourself, or how you see yourself through other people's eyes, and all that disappointment, yeah. your parents, and um, how how to how to survive all that um, negative view of yourself and the self-loathing. Don't let it become self-loathing. So. You have to believe that there's an advantage. 
that, that, that there's a more positive view of yourself. Yeah. So maybe we're, we're onto something here. Yeah. yeah. yeah maybe that, that to, to give that as a gift for people. Even a difficult story, even a story that's hurt other people or whatever is a story. And there's a value in, ha in being a story and having a story. Yeah. Well, a lot of, you know, a lot of the really positive turns that your, that your development took came through, came through significant pain. And, uh, you know, I was, I was thinking as I was listening to you also that, um, you know, there's a, there's a real risk of holding back development of our kids by making, by trying, trying to shield them from too much of this also. And that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a balance, but there's a salutary effect to dealing with some of these very difficult life circumstances also that, uh, that I think we can, we can weaken children if we don't give them some opportunity to, to work through these things themselves and, and, uh, and modify their own visions. So. My single most vivid memory after going around and, you know, and talking about my dyslexia would be people afterwards coming up to me. And it didn't make any difference how many people were behind them or whatever. They wanted to tell me their story. They really, the parents wanted to tell me their story, what they went through, the young people. Everyone had a story that they want, and it did. And they, once they started telling, they would lose all sense of place. It it didn't make any difference. It wasn't like a book signing. It wasn't. It was uh, an opportunity to tell me. It didn't even they didn't even know who they were telling it to anymore. It's just they just really had a. Maybe that's the common thread. Okay. Well, well, wonderful talking. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Great. Hours. No, it didn't. We 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 went right back to where we started, where we <laughs> left off. You know, it didn't take much. <laughs> well, let's not let's not wait seven years for the next. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, wow. And congratulations again on the book. Thank you, and thank really you for awesome. reading it and liking it. And Fantastic. Really, uh,